Hi, I'm Andy Matushek. <laughs> I lead mobile engineering at Khan Academy, but before that, I used to work at Apple, where, among other things, I was responsible for care and feeding of the touch and gesture systems. Now, when iOS shipped back in 2007, it had a uh, touch API that was very much like the DOMS API, capturing and bubbling, and it completely broke down as we tried to build fancy multi-touch interfaces. So today, I'm going to share some stories of how it broke down, because this community, as Ben Alpert alluded to earlier, is going to need to deal with that. I'm not going to provide solutions, nor am I suggesting that iOS's solution is the right or the best one, um, but hopefully this will help you uh, feel comfort in the fact that this is a hard problem, and maybe it will inspire you uh, to come up with some ways of fixing it, and uh, you'll, you'll, know, um, you'll know at least some of the kinds of problems that you might encounter on this particular road. Now, as usual, with these kinds of architectural design issues, it really is going to be all about drawing boundaries between things. And today we're going to talk about drawing boundaries between the components of your application, between the individual gestures attached to those components, and between touch sequences themselves. So first off, let's look at a comparatively simple interaction. This is mail on iOS, and I can scroll this list, and if I swipe from the edge, I can navigate back. Let's watch that one more time. I can scroll this list, and if I swipe in from the edge, I can navigate back. And that seems pretty simple, but there's something very subtle going on in that second touch sequence. Namely, when I put my thumb down on the edge of that screen and I start moving it, we don't know for several frames whether I am trying to do a scroll or I'm trying to swipe back from the edge of the screen. Now, say I am trying to swipe back, trying to navigate back. I'm not going to move perfectly horizontally. There's going to be some DY component there. But we don't want the list to scroll while we're not sure. So we're going to have to deal with some ambiguity. We're going to have to wait to know until we start doing something in the UI, or else it's going to look jittery and jerky. That might not be so bad to implement if these things existed in the same component, but they're not defined in the same component. The scrolling behavior is defined in the standard iOS scroll view, and the navigate back behavior is defined in the navigation component. Completely separate, they're both standard components. There's no reason they should have to know anything about each other. So the way this works with the iOS gesture system is that there's a declarative representation, much like React ended up echoing later, uh, of the behaviors of these components with respect to each other, and in particular, the gestures within the components. And this particular thing says, hey, any pan-type gestures in my subtree are not allowed to act until we are sure that the navigation back gesture is not going to recognize. So the navigation UI, the built-in system UI, defines that rule. And so everybody gets it for free. Um, but developers are free to override it. And by providing these declarative definitions, we are able to define complex intercomponent behaviors without any kind of special knowledge uh, in one of the other. Here is maps. As Ben alluded to earlier this morning, there's a lot of things you can do in maps. You can tap to select or deselect. You can long press to drop a pin. You can pan around. You can tilt in 3D. You can pinch. You can rotate. You can double tap to zoom in, and you can tap with two fingers to zoom out. Now, maybe you're thinking earlier, like, well, you know, I'm not a frameworks developer. I don't have to write this super general stuff like the navigation component in US scroll view. It's OK. I can define all these gestures, behaviors in one component. We don't have to deal with that boundary. So let's imagine that we're trying to implement all of those things within a map view component. So touch down happens. What can we say? Well. Touch up might happen a couple frames later, making it a tap. Or the touch might stay for a while, making it a long press. Or a second touch might arrive in a frame or two, making it a two-finger tap, and the user's just sloppy. We don't know. So let's say the finger lifts. So it's a tap, right? Well, we don't know. Because a few frames later, another touch might arrive, making it a double tap. So another touch arrives. Is it a double tap? We don't know. Because it might move around a little bit, making it a tap followed by a pan. That's a totally legitimate thing to do. You do not want to implement this state machine monolithically. iOS tried, and it was super buggy and impossible to change, and everybody was scared of it. <laughs> and uh, it lasted a couple of years until it was totally removed. And um, so uh, the solution in iOS is that uh, instead of having one big monolithic state machine, each of those gestures, tap, double tap, pan, pinch, et cetera, has an independent state machine, and there's a declarative system of rules that describes how those independent state machines relate to each other. So you are allowed, say, to pan, pinch, and rotate at the same time. You're not allowed to do almost any of the other gestures at the same time. You, uh, the tap gesture has to wait 
for the double tap gesture to fail before it's allowed to act, and so on and so forth. So we have this declarative system of rules, and that declarative system of rules allows us to define complex inner gestural behaviors without any kind of coupling between them. So far, we've been giving multi-touch a short shrift because we've been assuming that every single time there's multiple touches, they all belong to the same gesture. But that's not necessarily the case. And in fact, if we're really gonna explore what the multi-touch platform has to offer, we have to be a little more open-minded than that. So here's Keynote. I can put my finger down and start reordering a slide, but I can also tap some other slides to add them to the stack that's under my finger. And then I can drop and they all move together. If you're gonna implement that using traditional capturing and bubbling events, you're gonna have a whole bunch of coupling at the parent of all of those components. But we don't want that. On iOS, nothing special happened to, to make this work. Instead, there were just a bunch of normal events, the tap event that would have selected the slide in the first place, the pan event that lets you move around, those just continue to recognize independently because they have independent state machines. But there's, again, a declarative representation of the rules that connect those things, i.e. those things are allowed to happen at the same time. They can involve disjoint sets of touches, it doesn't matter, it's all fine. And uh, iOS is happy to let those things continue recognizing simultaneously. There doesn't need to be a single owner of that sequence of touches. So those are just a few examples of the kinds of problems that you might encounter if you're trying to uh, solve high-level multi-touch issues. If you encounter those problems in your application, you don't have to feel bad. They are serious problems that the API does not really uh, allow for, and uh, I hope that together as a community we can come together and uh, define an even better API for dealing with them. Thanks very much. Thank you.